Excuse me. No, it's fine. I'm just very echoey. That's actually what I was thinking of. Yeah, I can hear you. This is the right class for me to be yelling at everybody, though. Yeah, that's actually my normal voice is tinny. All right, so I'm going to start it off by saying let's just open up to Psalm 55. We're going to be in Judges 16, but that's going to be at the end of it. I have a perception of what my voice sounds like on the microphone, so if it sounds tinny, let me know, and uh, it looks like Ray is back there working on it. But we're going to start off in Psalm 55 in just a couple of seconds. Um, before we go any further, though, I'm going to ask Clint if he doesn't mind to lead us in a word of prayer. Amen. Thank you. There's not really a good introduction for imprecatory prayer, so I'll just open up by asking what are imprecatory prayers? Okay, that is actually the correct answer. Those that imprecate is the pronunciation there. Okay, yeah, that's probably a good way to put it. Imprecatory prayers are prayers that call down curses or some kind of justice or judgment on somebody else. There's lots of biblical versions of this, as we'll get to here in a second, but it is something like this ever, A, biblical, and B, necessary. I kind of gave away the first answer. But are calling down curses of any kind just biblical at all? I was about to say, everybody feels like they knows the answer. They know the answer, but they don't want to say it. It is, it is in the Bible. It is biblical. Imprecatory prayers are biblical. What is the occasion for calling down imprecatory prayers? This, yeah, if Christianity is in jeopardy, if I feel like I need God to adjudicate in a certain situation, I think that can be an appropriate one. Yeah, Christianity is threatened. What else is the occasion for an imprecatory prayer? We're basically covering everything we're going to cover in the class in these first three minutes, so this, that's why this is confusing. Right. Okay, I'm not as sure about that. I'll have to think about that one a little bit more. But I do think that there are occasions where Paul does pray for imprecatory prayers. And they're, they're kind of at the tail end of his life. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But they are, they are somewhat, uh, sometimes very personal. I do agree with you on that one for sure. There are also occasions where Paul makes imprecatory prayer type statements where he says, we are going to deliver this one to Satan for deliverance of his flesh. That has more to do with that person finding out their way back to God, I think, than anything else. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, when you have an answer with Paul, half the time it's going to be right. I was just kind of categorizing off the back of it, which is you're right. It is a very personal thing. Paul does do it. Um, but it also is it's a little bit more specific and not as personal sometimes we think. But I think you're right in a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> what gave you that clue? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Samson is an interesting example because, like, like Paul mentioned, they are distinctly personal in a lot of ways, where they're asking for God's intervention to accomplish, maybe especially if you're early in your career, to accomplish kind of protection around you. Samson's, I think, kind of hits on a couple different levels. It's very personal, but it's also very judgment-oriented. And that's going to be the key word this morning as we discuss some precatory prayers. Is he a good example? I don't know. I'll leave that for the end of the class to decide. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 
Right. The ones that are clear, quick, mm -hmm. it, it kind of takes the stress off of you. Right. Right. So in precatory prayers, as far as I understand, and I could be way off on this, because this is one of those conversations that most people don't talk about because it can be uncomfortable, but also because there's some confusion around why anyone would use this to begin with, which makes it probably the most controversial class that will do this entire quarter. But in my understanding of it, it all goes back to justice. You're calling down God's justice and his judgment on a certain situation. Think, for instance, Revelation chapter 6, where you have all the souls under the altar and they're crying out, how long, O Lord, until what? Until you avenge our blood that's on the earth. That is a very distinctly personal thing, but it is also in the nature of calling down judgment on somebody. What's the danger with something like that? Calling down judgment and justice. Because Job, you can argue, is an entire book of imprecatory prayers, albeit maybe sometimes on himself. That is one of the bigger issues, yeah, is you're passing judgment. But that being said, we all pass judgment every day about a variety of different things. And it should be judgment that's done with perfect, uh, use righteous judgment. Sorry, that's the word I'm looking for. Right. Passing judgment is basically making a decision one way or the other. But when you're making a judgment against somebody to be killed or to get to avenge yourself, that's that's not what God wants you to do. You've hit one of the sticky parts of it, which is it seems unnatural or unnecessary for us to call down prayers like this. And that's another question we could ask. Is there ever an occasion for us to have this? It seems unnecessary and borderline immoral for us to call down prayers of judgment on people because that's not what we're supposed to be and, or do. And yet we see it in Scripture several times. David has several imprecatory prayers. You'd think if anybody didn't want judgment coming back on himself, it'd be somebody like him. So there's some stickiness to this. Anybody else have any thoughts? Yeah, Levi? Oh. No, you go ahead. You have priority. Because I saw you first. I think you were hinting towards this a while ago. The, um, if, you, if you seek, shall we say, expedited judgment right. against a group, a group or an individual, you have to be prepared for, for, for yourself to be caught in a collateral. Right. That's the danger of it. And that's why a lot of us will say things like, maybe not, we won't say it knowing that it's an imprecatory prayer, but we'll say things like, oh, I wish that you would deal with this or that you would handle this person that's really a thorn in my flesh. That is a borderline imprecatory prayer. It's not necessarily a scriptural one, but it is something that we do out of emotion. The danger of it, though, is, as you mentioned, you have to be ready for God's judgment, judgment and justice to apply to you as well. So the danger of it is you have to make sure that you're in a good position with God before you start, if you, before you start deliberately doing this type of stuff. Yeah, Curtis? Okay. It's a matter of David wasn't able to operate. Right. David was not able to achieve the things as king as he should. Right. And uh, there are those who are obstructing justice, and those who are obstructing God's way that, that, that in the administration. Right. And so as we look at it, what about for us? Well, there are some things that prevent us from operating as Christians. Right. Right. And that's that's what Paul was getting at, which is I'm praying that this obstruction be removed so that the work can kind of continue. And I agree with you. When you look at Psalm 55, for instance, this is one of those psalms. And there's lots of psalms that David has where he kind of has an imprecatory type statement. Psalm 7 is another one that's very similar. But in Psalm 55 and verse 9, he says, Confuse our Lord, divide their tongues. For I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around her upon her walls. Iniquity and mischief are in her midst. Destruction is in her midst. Oppression and deceit do not depart from her streets. So right there... You have an idea of what the situation is like in the environment that he's operating in. Verse 12, though, it says, It is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor it is one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide myself from him. But it is you, a man my equal, my companion, my f familiar friend. We had sweet fellowship together, walked in the house of God in the throng. Let death, death come deceitfully upon them, let them go down alive to Sheol. For evil, evil is in their dwelling in their midst." Right at the outset here, you have the situation as it's discovered, as David is talking about it. And then when you get to verse 15, he talks about how this relationship with this friend has kind of deteriorated to the point where now that friend is backstabbing him, is doing things to thwart the efforts that uh, Paul and Curtis were both talking about. And now he gets to this point in verse 15, let death come deceitfully upon them, let them go down alive to Sheol, for evil is in their dwelling in their midst. 
Why is, or what is he praying for? I guess that's the easiest question to ask. What is he praying for in verse 15? This is another one of those points where you know what he's praying for. You just don't want to be the one to say it. He does want them dead, and he uses very vivid language to describe this. When he gets to imprecatory prayers, he doesn't really mince words, and I think there's a reason for that that we'll talk about here in a second. But if you jump a couple chapters later to Psalm 58 and verse 6, he says, O God, shatter their teeth in their mouth. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. These are very emotionally charged statements that he makes that seem very out of character for somebody like David. Why is it that he's saying things like this, though? David is a very emotional person, as you can tell from the plethora of psalms that he has. But why is he saying things like this? I agree with that to a certain extent. He's so emotional that he doesn't really, maybe he doesn't think all these statements through and maybe he is acting on emotion rather than logic. I can see that for sure. Curtis? Right. Right. And so I think the first part of that is not about punching the mouth, it's break their their ability to to ravage the victims. I agree with you the, theologically speaking, that what he's arguing for here is the ability the ability to neutralize the the threat that's incoming. I agree with that. Emotionally, I look at that and I say, that's pretty graphic language. So I think that you can kind of go both ways. There's another uh, precatory psalm that's very similar to this that's actually quoted in John chapter 2, I think, verse 17, where Jesus is cleansing the temple. Do you remember what it is that the apostles remember about that? It says, when he's cleansing the temple, they remember a psalm. Does anyone remember? Yeah. Right. As Jesus is cleansing the temple, he's slipping over the tables of the money changers. The apostles remember a psalm from the Old Testament that says, Zeal for thy house has consumed me, which comes from an imprecatory psalm, which is exactly what we're talking about right now. How is it that David writes things like this? How is it that Jesus behaves in such a manner like that? Why is there such an emotional charge behind these words and these actions? Because Jesus wasn't wrong in cleansing the temple. I think all of us would agree with that. Right. What they would do is just let it build up and build up and build up. And then mm-hmm. it was zero kill. <laughs> you know, yeah. You, you got that wasn't at all where I thought you were going with that, but yeah, go ahead. You know, yeah. As a human, we've got to let it out. Yeah. There is, a, there is a sense in which you're exa- I didn't. I was not thinking the serial killer route, but I understand now what you're talking about. When you said they, I thought you were talking about the nation, not an individual. But you're right. If somebody has these emotions, they need to let it out in a healthy way. That's where it comes back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, be angry and yet don't sin. That's an Old Testament statement as well. So there is a sense in which we need to let our emotions out in a healthy way. And I agree with that. Imprecatory Psalms can serve that purpose, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, that, there's a reason for this graphic language, and that's why I keep asking this question is, what's the reason for this type of language? Why is it that Jesus, because Jesus could have done a lot of things in the temple. He could have walked in and preached a parable. You know, there were three men sitting in the temple. One was a money changer. He could have done that. He could have had a miracle that vanishes all the tables right away, which I personally would have loved to see. But he doesn't do that. He goes in and he flips over tables, and I think John records either the first or the second one, that he comes in with a whip and drives people out. So why is it that he acts in that way and not in a parabolic type of sermon way? Yeah. Yeah, righteous indignation. That's closer to where I'm getting at. It's the ability, it's the fact that I'm furious about something that God is furious about. Curtis? Right. Consider a pedophile, a pedophile, or Right. Realistically, all sins are equal and that they end in the same way. Right. However, some have much greater impact upon others. Yeah. That's what, what he's looking at. The impact of these evildoers in his kingdom 
Right. That's such a great, and he's furious about the whole thing. Yeah. Just as in the temple, Christ is furious about what's going on because the impact he has on everybody else. They're monetizing it rather than uh, putting up what is the spiritual house. Yeah. It comes, down, it comes down to seeing things in the world the same way that God sees them. And that's why I think imprecatory psalms can be tricky because they seem to speak to our base primal desire of acting on our anger and saying what's ever on our heart. But that's not really the core of it. The core of it is I'm seeing things the same way God does, and I have the same anger and hatred, and on the other side, love and adoration for things that God does. So that righteous indignation, I think, is at the root of all of it. Paul? Well, to follow up with Chris, and I think all this will these instances are, as I said earlier, these people are human, they have human emotions because he could just as easily have said, let this burden be removed, your will be done. Right. Whatever you want to do. Yeah. Right. It could, for sure. I mean, and whether that's right or wrong, I think it's preserved because, at least in some way, it's something for us to learn from. And I think when you get back to the whole attitude of Jesus, I mean, he could have done a number of things. He could have walked in and said, well, I'm just going to be a good example, or I'm just going to go in and try to talk to them privately. But he didn't choose to do that. He chose to act in the way he did because of the offensiveness of what he was saying. And I, that's an attitude that Lot did not have that I think is worth mentioning. Let's get Levi and then Debbie. Right. Yeah. That's the thing that drives them. And how they accomplish it has to be biblical, but it also encompasses quite a bit of emotion as well. Yeah. Which also explains, go ahead, sorry. Which also explains why it's not, you know, why it's not us that's going in there with a sword and cutting people down. It's we're, we're giving room, as I think Joe mentioned earlier, we're giving room for the wrath of God. If you look, back, by the way, back at verse 16, right after what we stopped with in Psalm 55, if you look in verse 16, this exact mentality permeates the rest of this thing. He says in verse 16, As for me, I shall call upon God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will complain and murmur. He will hear my voice. He will redeem my soul in peace from the battle, which is against me, for there are many who strive with me. This is a good passage to kind of examine in precatory psalms because David could have very easily taken matters into his own hands and done what? He has this friend who is obviously betraying him, stabbing him in the back, thwarting the efforts. What could he have done? He could have had him killed. That's fair. Yeah. What did he choose to do? He chose to let God handle it. Now, here's the question about all of this. Why is it that he chose to let God handle this instead of taking matters into his own hands? Right. Right. And I think that's that's one of the other X factors in this whole thing is that God is a mu understanding that God is a much better diviner of justice than we are. We see a situation very two dimensionally. I see it over there. I'm over here. I don't necessarily have a the other periphery information. I don't see the heart. I don't see the future of all these different actions. I also don't see the downfall of what my actions could bring about. And so as we look at things in a very 2D fashion, God sees it from every perspective. And ultimately, what we're calling upon here is God's will to play out in terms of justice for a situation. We're, and it also, I would argue, kind of leaves a lot less stress in our life that we just let God handle it instead of letting us handle it. Any other thoughts or comments? Let's look at Deuteronomy 32. We are going to get to Judges 16 eventually, in case you're wondering. But we're going to get to Deuteronomy 32 now. This is in the middle of this long sermon where these curses and blessings kind of come upon. Look in Deuteronomy 32, starting in verse 34. This is talking right before this about the nations that threaten Israel and the enemies that they'll have in the area. And the temptation is obviously to just kind of take personal vindication, go after them yourselves. In verse 34 of Deuteronomy 32, it says, Is it not laid up and stored with me, sealed up in my treasury? He's talking about God. Vengeance is mine and retribution. In due time their foot will slip, for the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. 
For the Lord will vindicate his people and will have compassion on his servants when he sees that their strength is gone and there is none remaining bond or free. And he will say, where are their gods, the rock in, whom, in which they sought refuge, who ate the fat of their sacrifices, drank the wine of their drink offering? Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your hiding place. See now, verse 39, that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded. It is I who heal, and there is no one who can deliver from my hand. What's the point of imprecatory prayers, or at least leaving things in God's hands from those verses? Because there's a few other things that Moses brings up in this passage. Oh, Curtis? Right. Yeah, I mean, and kind of appealing to him, and there's that ownership clause right there where he says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. You can view that through an authoritarian reign which says, this is everything that I was going to do is God's domain. It's not mine. I'm not going to, as we would say, whittle on God's end of the stick. So there is certainly the authoritative part of it. What else does Moses reveal in this passage about imprecatory prayers? Right. Yeah, if I, if I want to take vengeance in my own hands, there's a greater than average chance that I probably won't succeed in whatever it is that I'm trying to do. There's a 0% chance that God won't succeed. God always succeeds. It's 100% of the time he wins. Yeah. What else does he point out about this? Right. For whatever reason, when you said that, I thought of God standing in front of a big file cabinet. Thank you for your prayer. I'll put it in the judgment queue. Yeah. And that, I mean, there is some truth to that. God hears our prayers. He hears our pleas. And then he acts accordingly. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. He acts in his own time. And his time schedule is never on our time schedule. We want it tomorrow. And we want it really visible. And we want it really painful. And we're not going to be happy until we get that. Fortunately, every... Every judgment that God passes down is so much greater and more important. It's truthful than what we would do. So what else does he point out about this, Ken? <laughs> you can talk about anything at this point, Tom. That's fine. Yeah. So I did, not, I did not intentionally plan for this class to be on 9-11. That hit me a couple weeks ago, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess if I had thought about this connection a little longer, we would have had a whole different slide to talk about how 9-11 works in tangent or in, in, in parallel with imprecatory prayers. Because I think there's a lot of carryover. You know, the emotional charged nature of our prayers right after 9-11 is, I want justice to be done now. And when I say justice, what I mean is I want the entire country nuked. Everyone that's over there that had any part of this, I want them all dead. That's what I want. I want their bodies to be displayed because they did something like this that hurt us. But then there's the perspective of it to say, okay, well, maybe there's people that didn't, you know, didn't have a part in that, so maybe I don't want the entire country nuked. But then it ultimately goes, goes back to, I want God to vindicate us, but it's not a Christian nation as much as it is just a heinous, sinful attack on people. So, you know, where does this all kind of come together? I think praying for justice to be done on the hijackers or justice to be done on the people responsible for it, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. As long as we don't come from an overtly I hate you prayer stance. So maybe that's wrong of me, but that's where I'm at on it. <laughs> and immediately four hands go up. Ray, go ahead. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
praying. Or we pray for we pray for peace, and what we really mean is revenge. And that's that's the point of the prayer when he says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The whole point of that is not to amplify the vengeance; it's to moderate the vengeance. It's to say, okay, I you took my eye, I'm not going to go take two of yours. And that that's where getting back to Samson. That's where Samson comes in at the end of it. Is where is the equality in that? I mean, you can you can argue there is none, but it's it's a coordinated response and an equal response to what happened. And so you're right. Sometimes we say, I want peace, when in reality what we want is personal revenge more than anything else. Jason? I was just thinking that these Old Testament examples would record the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> yeah. That's true until you get, and you're exactly right about that, that there is, there is the tendency to turn the other cheek you know, in personal relationships, which I do think falls under the vein of what we were just talking about. I'm not going to take personal revenge on, for myself. I'm going to leave... God to do that until he gets passages like 2 Timothy 4 and verse 14 where in the middle of this long discussion about Paul's own perspective on his life and his work and his future he says Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm may the Lord repay him according to his deeds that's a very specific and short imprecatory prayer because what is Paul asking for in this passage and you're right by the way there's a greater necessity for grace in our lives than we sometimes give it but there are things like this in the New Testament Curtis Right. Yeah. There, there's a lot of questions. And of course, when you said that, I, I smiled a little bit because, I, and I know what you were saying is he's leaving it all up to God in this. It would be foolish of us to say that there's no emotion behind these words. And because when you, when you read something like this, it's hard not to think of, for instance, Demetrius in Acts 18 in Ephesus who raised up everybody against Paul and basically threw him inside of a huge amphitheater, humiliated him, threatened him with death and all these different things. There are people, it seems like, in Paul's life, and 2 Timothy 4 is full of this. There are people in Paul's life that he wants to highlight for good or bad reasons. Alexander is a, a bad one, obviously. But he's leaving it purely in the hand of God. And he says, whatever is going to happen to him in due, in due course is going, to take, is going to take place. I was thinking, for instance, Herod in Acts chapter 12, who killed Peter. And by the end of the chapter, he's eaten by worms. So whatever happens is going to take its due course eventually. Yeah, Paul? That's exactly what I'm going to say. Okay. I when Curtis does that to you. He does that to me. But he does it much more eloquently than me, for what it's worth. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts or comments? Yeah, Karen. Right. 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 Yeah. My opinion of that always is that the clothes are different, but people are relatively the same. Um, that's just my personal opinion. But you're right. I mean, it is, it is a much more persecution intense time. So that brings the question, are imprecatory prayers necessary for today's world? And I'll let everybody chew on that for a couple minutes while we talk about other stuff. But I think there are, I do think that there are occasions when imprecatory prayers are not only important, but sometimes very useful. So that's just my personal opinion. We'll talk about that more here in just a second. I want to finish up this thought in Deuteronomy 32. We asked the question about why, you know, what, what's he asking for? If you look in verse 36, kind of mostly in verse 37, I think you see another really important purpose of imprecatory prayers. In verse 37, it says, He will say, Where are their gods, the rock in which they sought refuge, who ate the fat of their sacrifices, drank the wine of their drink offerings? Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your hiding place. See now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. What other purpose does imprecatory prayer serve? And this is why I think it's really important, and it does serve at least some purpose in today's world. What do these prayers teach us? I like the one, the one true God. Exactly. If I... No others, no others are going to... You can pray to anybody else you want to, but they're not going to come help you. Right. Yeah, you can pray and talk to whoever you want to, but those people are toothless. They have no... There's no power within them. 
if, I, if I'm attacked as a nation, or if I'm, a, not, I'm not a nation, if I'm attacked, and I don't know why I'm thinking of everything in terms of lawn care, but if my neighbor attacks my yard and I go over and attack their yard, there's nothing learned there. It's just two people angrily fighting against each other with lawn mowers. There's no purpose in that. If God's people are blown to smithereens within an inch of their life, and they somehow come back, and not only come back, but dominate the nations around them, that's not a testament to the people. Who is that a testament to? 100% it's a testimony to God. And so for allowing God to intervene and let these things take their natural course, it gives all the more authority and glory to who God is rather than me and my own power. And I think that's a big part of imprecatory prayers too. I'm going to take my hands off the wheel. I'm still going to do what I need to do and still going to move on and still ask for help and still do what's right. But the vengeance aspect of this is in your hands. That's where I'm going to leave it. John? Right. Yeah. <clears throat> right. And it also, we didn't, I'm glad you mentioned that because it also, it also talks about the nature of revenge to begin with. I mean, if we are people who are wrapped up with taking our own vengeance and our own revenge, that's just going to turn our lives in a knot and it's going to turn us upside down. By giving those things to God and letting God handle that, that frees us to focus on good things that we should be doing rather than taking revenge. I think that's a good point. Does anybody else have any thoughts or comments on that? Everybody right now is thinking of that person, so we'll move on. I think there are a couple of things we need to know about imprecatory prayers. Imprecatory prayers always, number one, leave judgment in the hands of God, 100% of the time. They never, it's never, you know, God, you're going to do this, and while you're doing that, I'm going to slash their tires. That's never the idea. It's always in the hands of God. He has his perfect judgment. He dispenses it as he wills. We always ask for justice, not revenge. What's the difference between these two things? We've talked about it a little bit so far. Right, that's exactly right. Justice is always a correct application of the law, and revenge is always retaliatory in a personal nature, which leads me to the third point, which is that imprecatory prayers are never personal. A wrong application of imprecatory prayer would be this guy took my parking spot. I'm going to ask for God to adjudicate in this situation and remove his car from the spot so that I can move. That's not an imprecatory prayer. What is an imprecatory prayer? If it's not personal, then what is it? Are you going to ask about the other parking spot? Because that's fine, too. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, which is once again part of that graphic language. I mean, it's not it's not enough that I just want God to handle it. I'm gonna. So is that revenge? No, I don't think so. I mean, when you look at when you look at, for instance, that specific application, I know you're talking about one of the Psalms because the Psalms do talk about kind of a snare being trapped for them. That's number one in response to what he believes they're doing to him. They've laid a trap for me. I pray for a trap to be spread for you. But that also brings to mind Korah. And Korah was somebody who rose up with you know, a bunch of other people and challenged Moses' you know, Moses's credibility. The fact that the earth opened up underneath them led nobody, led nobody to doubt where Moses' authority came from. I mean, it's a supernatural event that never happens. Um, the reason it's on my mind is because that's apparently what they're discussing in Bible class. And Logan was talking to me about it. But I, it's never... It's never personal. It's always, it's always according to what God's will is. God has decreed that Moses should lead the people, not Korah. And that's what Moses says to them. It's not my choice. Yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments on that? While you think about it, Ray, go ahead. Okay. Uh huh. Right. Have you and Jason been talking? Is that? No, I, I think that's a really, really fair question. And it's, it's fair to ask in an age of grace why we even have prayers like this. The prayers are never for, if the prayers are never personal, and if you have an example of Paul using it, 2 Timothy 4, you have an example of Jesus using it, then what it does is it helps us focus on what God's will ultimately is instead of our own. And it prays for God's perfect justice to dole out in a lot of different situations. And we tend to think of it in graphic terms like the example with Korah, 
But it's not always that graphic. Let justice be done in the streets doesn't always end with somebody's death. It could just mean somebody has a change of heart. It could just mean that certain situations humble somebody. But what you're praying for ultimately is for God's perfect intervention to take place in what I perceive as being an unequal situation. And it may be, as we talked about the dangers earlier, it may be that I'm the one that needs my mind changed and not, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you pray in an imprecatory prayer and the earth opens up underneath you, then probably not smart to have done that. But I think that there is, the, I think that's one of the applications and why, to me, it's never wrong to fixate on how God would intervene in a situation. You know, like in 9-11 is a perfect example. If God acted today the same way he does in the Old Testament, how would he handle this situation? Because how he handles it is how I should handle it. The whole point of this is my passions line up with his in both good and bad formats. So that's the very long-winded answer to your question. Now let's go to Levi. Go ahead. I love how when this happens. Oh, yeah. yeah, let me put my clicker down. Yep. Mm-hmm. Where do you put, uh, he's on the outskirts of town, and a bunch of kids come out and start to play, and he, raises, he brings down fiery bear vengeance on them. Okay, so two years ago I did a lesson called Quick Lessons from Weird Stories, where I covered that exact thing with Elisha and Second Kings 2. The, the long or the short answer to that is, is, A, they weren't youths. They were probably people who knew better. B, it was a mark of disrespect not just towards Elisha but towards the office. C, Elisha was praying for God's justice to happen. The bears came out and mauling 42 of the youths shows that it was also a larger scale event than just a couple kids throwing rocks at him. That's the way I would answer that. Um, I don't think that Elisha called the 42 youths. He didn't have the direct power to do that, so obviously God did. So there's a bridge of faith there. But I would argue that in that moment, it's a prayer for that action, for that immediate. It is. The fact that it was answered shows that God intervened the right way. Right. He's being assaulted, act, actively insulted. Mm -hmm. um, however, I think I think where you hit it was the. Uh, it's also an attack on his position as, as right. a spokesman for God. So not not just him as a person. But right. If you track Elisha's interactions with Elijah, it seems like in, in 1 Kings 21 that Elisha comes onto the scene relatively early. So he would have been familiar with a lot of the personal attacks on Elijah. That would have been right after Mount Carmel. So he would have been familiar with a lot of the personal attacks. I would like to think, and maybe this is me wishful thinking, I would like to think that he developed a measure of maturity to not let something like that bother him. I do think on kind of a, a tangent, it's a, it's a bigger commentary in the nation at large that they're willing to humiliate his office. I mean, you don't know of many other prophets besides Elijah at that time. 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal leaves about 800,000 that have. So there, it's a very unhealthy situation, and I think it shows the disrespect that they have towards God. So, yeah. There you go. You got one-third of the sermon, so I guess the sermon today will be a third shorter. Go ahead, Curtis. Right. Right. Yeah. And so I, I think about the, the, the prayer for justice. What if there was an individual who can change and the things that are going on are in preparation for that person? To right. And see, that's the thing John brought up earlier about that exact same concept, which is, you know, we don't, we don't wish for revenge. We don't dole it out ourselves because we don't have the perfect picture. We operate in a 2D platform. We don't have the full picture of what's going on. And it may be that God is not allowing justice to take place at this moment because he knows a year, 10 years from now, it's going to affect something greater for the kingdom. And I mean, Paul is, Paul is upfront about that. And I think, I never remember if it's first or second, but in Timothy 1.16, he talks about his example of grace as a testimony that everybody can have grace. And we talked about last week, if every situation was Ananias and Sapphira, then who would, be, who would even be sitting here right now? So justice being done perfectly doesn't just involve the, the severity of it. It also involves the timing of it. And I think, there's a lot, I think there's a lot of truth to that, for sure. One of the other things that we know about imprecatory prayers is that it always has a purpose. And that kind of goes to what we were talking about there a second ago with Curtis and earlier with John. In Romans chapter 12, for instance, and we won't, uh, 
We won't read all of Romans 11, but if you look at Romans chapter 11, the first 12 so verses, he talks about the nature of the relation between Jews and Gentiles, and there's a lot of animosity between there. If you, if you read mostly 11, there's some in 10 and a little bit of 9, but there's a lot of animosity, and all of Romans 11 is talks about the old root taken out, the new ones grafted in. There, seems, there needs to be a relationship there between each other. Romans 12, on the other hand, kind of operates as this practical application of the theological statements of Romans chapter 11. And so he's just kind of hitting bullet points here. Most people think that Paul meant to end his letter in 12. He just kind of kept going after that for whatever reason. But if you look in verse 14, he hits these very bullet point type things. Romans 12 and verse 14. He says, bless those who persecute you, bless and don't curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, be of the same mind towards one another, don't be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly, don't be wise in your own estimation. Now he goes into the revenge territory, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will reap burning coals on his head. Do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The practical application of that section in regards to 11 is really, really significant. Because as you have people within a strictly spiritual setting, you have Jews and Gentiles, in many cases, in the same church. They both believe in the same God. They're both striving. Yet there's some, there's some animosity and some tension between there. What does Paul say to do in Romans 12, 14 through 21? How do you handle that animosity and that tension? And this is not a left side of the church, right side of the church thing, in case you're wondering. But how do you handle animosity inside of a distinctly spiritual setting? Be kindly affectionate to one another. Yeah, I like that translation. That's a good one. Mine uses something much more blunt than that. Don't take everything personal. <laughs> yeah, don't take everything personal. Enter the parking lot conversation. Yeah, don't take everything so personal. What else does he say? Vengeance is his, he will repay. And that brings up a bigger point, which is if we take revenge for ourselves, then there's no room for the wrath of God. If I'm taking that, then there's no room for the wrath of God. I think that's a good point, too. Right. Right. I don't know if you, if you meant 8 or if you meant 18. 18, okay. Because that's to me, is the pivot verse for all of this. In verse 18, read it again. He says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, notice that double qualifier, be at peace with all men. In other words, go above and beyond in order to ensure that peace reigns inside of a local congregation. Because if it doesn't, then everything kind of goes haywire. So as much as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. That has applications both forward and backwards. Because right after that, he talks about revenge. Revenge is not ours, it's God's. In verse 20, the end of it, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. In so doing, you will heap burning coals in his head. That brings about some questions that people have had about the nature of imprecatory prayers, which is that double motivation. I think Ray was talking about that a little earlier. In praying prayers for somebody else, I wish justice would be done to them. I wish that everything would be fine. I wish that you would, you would handle the situation. There can be an ulterior motive, which says that I'm not going to judge you, but God's really going to judge you. And that is kind of a double slam behind that. It could be, yeah. <laughs> I agree with you. In in theory, it can be that somebody who is not doing what they should be doing, you know, has some kind of good blessings come from God, and it wakes them up to the reality of where all blessings come from. In theory, that's right. I don't know if in 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 everyday terms, if maybe that always plays out. Yeah. Right. Right. And the only counterpoint I would say back to that, and this is all I'll say, is that it says, bless those who bless you. So I think he's kind of talking about 
you know, the nature of always returning good, good for any kind of response that you have. If somebody's evil, return good. If somebody blesses you, return good. So I, I think that's kind of what he's getting at. But I agree with you for sure. I think we see this sometimes when we, when we have this attitude of heaping coals in their fire. The thing that I was getting at was I think sometimes we say, you know, when we're arguing with somebody, well, I'm just going to pray for you. It's kind of that passive-aggressive nature of it. it. It's not really you wishing prayer on them. It's you kind of saying, well, I'm just going to let God handle that because I obviously already think you're a dumb dumb. I, that attitude doesn't need to be present inside of a congregation. And that's why verse 21 to me is a great finisher. Don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. It, it's not enough to just let sinfulness fester. That's not what we should be doing. You have to let good rain out towards everybody. And how you handle those situations can have a huge impact. Curtis? I've always thought of it as just pelting people with charcoal. That's, I mean, that's the way I've always seen it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I've actually never thought of that before. I think that's a good, if that is the, the exact meaning, I think that's a great way to put it. I've always kind of equated this with what uh, Jesus talks about in, um, in the Sermon on the Mount. I can't remember the exact phrase where he talks about um, turning the other th- a cheek, I think is what Jason mentioned earlier. But it's about... You know, if somebody if somebody is mean towards you, you repay them with kindness because it it ultimately shows well. It ultimately lets God handle that. You've done your job. Let God handle it from there. I, that was a horrible explanation. My mind just went completely blank on that. Levi. Maybe that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Right. Um, and you don't react in the manner in which either they expect or possibly even want it. Maybe they yeah. do that properly. Sometimes people just like to pick a fight. <laughs> no. And, yeah. and you react complete 180 mm-hmm. and help them out with something or, or go out of your way to do something nice for them. That, that, can, that can really put a lot of shame in somebody's mind. Realize how yeah. Like whatever it's been. Yeah. Solomon talks about that a few times in Proverbs, and one of them, I can't remember where it's at, but he says a, a, rightly, a rightful word fitly spoken is like, a, is like a golden table or something like that. But if somebody's responding angrily to you, a, a kind word back sometimes can completely diffuse the situation. And I think that's a lot of what Paul's getting at in Romans 12, is like if, if you repay evil for evil, it's just going to amplify to the point that the church splits, and, and that's not a good situation for anybody. Let's ask the question that we uh, kind of skirted around at the beginning. Judges chapter 16, verse 28 Samson is kind of the archetype for these imprecatory, imprecatory prayers. And at the end of Samson's life, he says, Oh, Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time, O oh God, that I may be at once avenged at, Phil- at the Philistines from my two eyes. On the one hand, Samson is trying to destroy God's enemies. There's no question that he's trying to do that. On the other hand, he makes it distinctly personal by saying, I want to be avenged at the Philistines from my two eyes. And I know you can interpret that however you want to. But does Samson's prayer in Judges 16, verse 28, fall under the category of imprecatory prayers? Or is it just him wanting to get even for people that hurt him? You can answer that if you don't want You cannot answer it. We've got about 18 seconds. Okay, so John thinks it's kind of him getting wanting to get even. I can kind of see that. See, that's why it's such a great example is because he, he wants to get even, but he knows he can't, so he leaves it in God's hands. The fact that God grants him that strength means that God has answered it. But is that really, you know, is that really the right motivation? I'm with John and no. Does this fit under the category of imprecatory prayers, though? What led to him We don't have to go down that trail. Yeah. <laughs> we talked about that last Wednesday, and we'll talk about it a little bit more this morning. But, yeah, I mean, the path that got him there, he should never have been on in the first place.
Right. I am 51% in the personal vengeance camp, 49% in the imprecatory prayers camp, precisely because of what you just said. It's, it seems to me an overtly personal thing, but that's not to say that God can't use situations like this to bring about justice. So whereas Samson may have been in the wrong for what he said, the situation, I think, could be rectified by what happened. Yeah. What's that? Well, I think he died right after this, but he might have. I mean, maybe it was repentance before that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's totally true. That's a valid point, Levi. I'm saying God clearly approved of this, regardless of Samson's motivation. Yeah. God approved of this action and gave the strength to do it. He couldn't have done it on his own. That's true. But once again, was God using the situation or was Samson right? That, and that, that's not really a question you can answer in a setting like this, but I do think it's something worth thinking about for sure. All right, we will pick up with something else next week. Thank you, guys.